Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How devastating is climate change? What can be done to reduce melting glaciers, desertification, and rising seas? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at climate change and some of the ill effects of what's going on in many areas of the world. My guest today is someone who has represented a country that's experienced it firsthand and is very knowledgeable of this issue. My guest today is Ambassador Stuart Beck. Ambassador Stuart Beck was Palau's first permanent representative to the United Nations from 2003 to 2013. He currently is the first ambassador of Palau for Oceans and the Seas. Ambassador Beck spearheaded initiatives to stop bottom trawling and shark finning, among others, and he also founded Ambassadors for Responsibility on Climate Change. Ambassador Stuart Beck, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Bill, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate you being with me today. We're going to get into the issues I mentioned a minute ago, but let's talk a little bit about Palau. Talk a little bit about the topography, the population, and even more so how Palau is the last country that was under the trusteeship council of the United Nations and came out of that. It, uh, but to talk a little bit about yes, the, no, where, that's uh, a, those Palau's items. Palau a real success story for the United Nations. Uh, in 1994, Palau joined the UN as a full member state. Uh, but when, uh, when uh, after World War II, uh, a trusteeship was formed for the entire former Japanese uh, territory in the Pacific. Uh, local folks basically agitated for independence in Palau and independence in the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. So that entity broke into three countries, Palau, the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. They were kept in trusteeship until they'd established a constitution, and Palau was therefore the last one to establish that constitution, and the last of 13 former colonies of Japan and Germany to emerge from trusteeship into independence. Mm -hmm. And Palau, how large is the population and how many islands do you have, more uh, or less? Uh, Palau's got several hundred islands uh, in an archipelago that runs about 160 miles north to south. Uh, and I saw, I was wondering if my book graphic was up there because <laughs> it has a picture. But it's about 160 miles north to south and it's got about 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. And when Palau first aspired to be a country, it was the smallest country in the world to aspire to be a country. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the book a minute ago, and we're just going to shoot that up there. It's titled Palau at the United Nations Reflections on Our Tenth Anniversary. And that was written by you. And what exactly, what was the thrust of the book? Um, it's a monograph, you know, a short book, uh, kind of about the ten years that we at the Palau Mission and the Palauan leadership have been fighting for uh, advances uh, uh, on some progress on climate change, uh, on oceans issues. And it kind of recounts those stories, hopefully uh, to uh, let other people know that a small country can have a big impact on the world, that it's not an excuse to be small. If you've got something to say, you should say it. Mm, exactly. So everybody has a role to play. And there is, is, you've certainly had a very, Palau has certainly had a very, very major input into many of the discussions and agenda setting at the United Nations. Let's go into the but we're talking about climate change, and it seems as though every other day there's a study, more and more studies coming out talking about climate change. It's with us. 97% of the scientists believe climate change is happening. That mostly the ill effects of climate change are with us. What, uh, how has Palau, as just sort of an example of a country, an island country, been affected by climate change? And maybe some of your other neighbors uh, who have been even more adversely affected, like the Philippines, a horrible typhoon that went through the Philippines not long ago. Right. But how have you been affected? Or Palau, well, I that, say. The, you know, there are three atoll nations in the Pacific. Uh, the Marshall Islands has really got a lot of atolls. 
Uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu are both atoll nations. Palau has uh, in its chain a few atolls, but it has high islands too. So it is for those lower atoll countries that we face imminent destruction. You know, as I was walking over here today, I got a uh, text from uh, uh, the prime minister, the uh, minister uh, in uh, assistance to the president of the Marshall Islands, Minister De Broom, and he said they were now facing 15-foot seas coming in on their five-foot high island, uh, and not as a result of any great catastrophe, but just a king tide. So what's happened has been the slow but gradual recognition by the people of these islands that they're losing their islands. And it's not in the future for them. They don't want to hear about a debate about the future. It's happening right now. Uh, it also is affecting and salinating their water supplies. Uh, it's killing the root crop, taro, in Palau, which grows close to the ocean. Uh, and, you know, in a very subtle psychological way, it's having a negative impact on the way people think about their future. I think young people now making decisions in these places are going to think about whether they should move or not. So one way or another, the cultures of these little islands are, are in danger of just dripping away. Exactly. Now, you're the Palau's ambassador to the Oceans and Seas. What is the Oceans and Seas group? Well, the, the, the uh, president of Palau, President Romangasau, has asked me to uh, help organize an international way to look at uh, the uh, oceans in a new way. And he and I have recognized that we're at a unique time in history when the General Assembly will be deciding uh, on the future sustainable development goals which will really control development in the world from 2015 to 2030. We're very lucky because we have the model of the Millennium Development Goals, which are ending. They were very successful, and they showed us a way, a framework of harnessing uh, activity from governments and civil society to attack problems like malaria, like HIV, AIDS. But Oceans was not in the MDGs. So I'm leading uh, uh, with uh, several island nations and now with an increasing group of member states and with the help of Amir Dassal, who really knows about creating multi-stakeholder partnerships, probably better than anyone. We're now trying to form a multi-stakeholder partnership to make sure that these islands have allies when it comes to the decision about what's going to control the development of the future. We want oceans to be on that that list because for these islands oceans is everything mm -hmm. and so that would be the standalone sustainable development goal exactly put that in there that one of whatever the UN and the countries of the world and the NGOs or whoever has input into this process that they get one that focuses on the oceans and the seas exactly because they're dying mm -hmm. and every year that we've watched some of the Millennium Development Goals get reached on malaria and on great progress on HIV, on tuberculosis, on, on child uh, mortality, the oceans have gotten worse. There's less fish uh, and they're less clean uh, and they, the coral reefs are less healthy and we're in danger of losing uh, what has nurtured these islands for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So it's time for them to kind of put their foot down and say, we understand the world has other priorities sometimes. We understand there are some landlocked countries, but we all have a role in the oceans because they are the lungs of, of the planet. Mm -hmm. They take up 50% of the carbon that's emitted. So uh, that's why they're dying, actually. Uh, but they're a sink for carbon far more than the forests. Mm -hmm. So we all have a stake in the oceans, but sometimes it's hard to convince people of that. It certainly is. And, of course, our viewers can go to SustainableOceansAlliance.org. Yes. SustainableOceansAlliance.org and yes. get more information on the topics that we're discussing today. You were talking about the oceans dying, and that, that is very true. The, the <coughs> statistics that are coming out are showing more and more that the coral reefs are being bleached, that they're dying. Take, it has taken hundreds of thousands, millions of years to create these coral reefs. The oxygen level in the ocean is de depreciating, it's diminishing. You have a situation where, as you mentioned, the oceans are dirtier. These are major issues and they will affect us. They may, they may be feel, we may think they're far removed right now in Palau, but they will certainly affect us, will they not, tomorrow? 
It's a, it's a nightmare scenario for everybody involved. Uh, you know, some of the stories of what's happening are so disturbing, you, you almost don't want to tell them. I've been teaching up at Yale, and one of the students there just came back from Patagonia, where she's studying the fact that the overfishing is so significant in that part of the world that when calf whales surface to breathe, they're attacked and killed by gulls. Uh, nobody's ever heard of anything quite like what's happening in the oceans. And that's as a result of overfishing, illegal fishing, and pollution. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a report, a healthy ocean by 2030. Is that a report? Is that on your website? That's a really a motto. Oh, it's a motto. It's a motto. Okay. I mean, it's an effort to demonstrate to the world that this is not hopeless. That if we have a, millennia, a sustainable development goal on oceans, and if we track it for the next 15 years, and countries pay attention, and the world pays attention, we can actually heal the oceans. Because what's wonderful about them is they're regenerative. You know, the Australians have showed us that on the Great Barrier Reef. We've seen it in New York here with striped bass out on Long Island. We can regenerate these stocks. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do, to actually regenerate the fish stocks of the world? You know, between now and 100 years, we've eaten 90% of the fish in the ocean. So why, why are we going to stand by and have the other 10% eat? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And the aquaculturalists will tell us that in the future, the majority of the fish we're going to be eating will be from aquaculture ponds or lakes or whatever the case might be because we have depleted the ocean, the fishes of the sea uh, to a large degree. We've overfished and, with, of course, with overpopulation, that all contributes to that. We, we were talking about Palau. Palau is out in the Pacific, several thousand miles away. but. These problems are affecting us right now. We see Hurricane Sandy was a devastating storm. The city of New York has a major study to see how they can deal with the East River when it rises or if the Atlantic Ocean starts to back in. Florida, Miami is doing the same thing. They're, they're spending millions of dollars on studies to see how they can protect their area. They're starting to coordinate with the Dutch, who are very good at living below sea level. But these, these problems are with us right now, are they not? It's something, isn't it? I mean, it's, a, it's turned into a really good business, you know. But the fact is, if public policy were really working here instead of private interests, then we would not be emitting as much carbon into the atmosphere and not going through all this. Because that money could probably a lot, be a lot better spent on educating our children and giving people health care than building walls so people mm -hmm. can continue to emit greenhouse gases. So I just think it's backward, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it, uh, so often we think, well, coal is cheap, but cheaper, but it's the dirtiest fossil fuel that's out there. And by the time you use that, you're creating so many other problems with the that's emission right. CO2, with uh, the uh, health problems that are associated with that, uh, with the problems of getting it out of the ground or however you're getting it. So it's really costing us more in the long run. Well, it may seem cheap, but it's not cheap to the people in the Rockaways uh, or in Staten Island. You know, mm -hmm. the effects are not economical. So that's why there's a UN, to spread that around in such a way so that everybody is taken care of. And that's not going to happen until we actually attack the causes of climate change. And it does not seem that we're inclined to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today, we're taking a look at climate change and the ill effects of climate change. My guest is someone who is an expert in this area. My guest is Ambassador Stuart Beck. Ambassador Stuart Beck is the former permanent representative of Palau to the United Nations, a position he held from 2003 to 2013, and he currently is the first Palau ambassador for the oceans and the seas. Ambassador Beck, we're talking about the situation with climate change. And again, the, the evidence is overwhelming. It is absolutely overwhelming when you have 97% of the scientists believe that climate change is happening. Now, they may not all be in agreement with when the total uh, impact of the ill effects will happen, but they're certainly in agreement that it's happening. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN body that was created in 1988, has come out with five major studies. These are absolutely, uh, this should really jar us to a large degree 
that we're sitting on a time bomb or sitting on a keg of powder that is going to get worse and worse and worse. How can we how can we raise this? I know the United Nations has had various conferences. How can you and there are private businesses that are trying to become more green, they're getting involved, they're looking at moving to solar, they're looking at moving to wind, energy forms, that type of thing. But how can we get more people involved? and help them better understand that they need to do something today because when the glaciers have melted, it's too late. They're not going to refreeze. Well, it's ironic, I think, that with 99% of every scientist in the world agreeing that greenhouse gas emissions uh, are changing the weather uh, and causing sea level rise like Sandy, that there's no public policy to attack it. So you really have to ask yourself, why that is not about the science anymore. The science is a given. So what's happened with public policy? Why doesn't anything work? Well, it's because, of the, uh, you know, I think we can all draw our own conclusions about that. But there's no n nothing new about the destruction of islands. Uh, you know, it's just this one's Manhattan. But there's nothing new here. This has actually been going on for the very same 22 years that these climate change so-called negotiations have been going on. Mm -hmm. you, when you were ambassador of Palau, or representing Palau at the United Nations, you took an issue before the Security Council. Now, the Security Council is one of the six organs of the UN, the most powerful one, 15 members, five permanent members, and they, their vetoes stand. They're binding on the nations or groups that they're applied against. And so it's, it's a very important organ of the UN, you took an issue to them to promote the idea that climate change is linked to peace and security, which is what the Security Council deals with. Explain that a little bit. How do you, how do you tie that in? Well, you know, this I can't take credit for this movement, which really I, I was able to advocate for in advance, but the whole Pacific, I think, felt that it was important to try and rethink climate change because it's not an environmental issue. For them, it's a security issue since their countries are being destroyed by it and their populations are going to be set off into the world to try and make a life on somebody else's territory. So it's a security issue, but that's been unsaid. Now, the reason that's been unsaid is because the Security Council is supposed to deal with security issues, and they have the power to deal with them, but they haven't. So we in the Pacific, and then the movement became wider, tried to get the Security Council to confront the fact that it had the power to prevent these islands from being destroyed, but didn't. Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. yes. And we see it today that you have a situation where the, the water supply to many of the indigenous peoples living in the uh, Altiplano in Bolivia is drying up. We see water supplies around the world in Israel. The, Many of the seas are, are uh, shrinking. Uh, Lake Chad, which used, to, which used to be as big as a football field, is now as big as a football. Mm. And so we can see that this is underway. But this is going to create a tremendous amount of conflict amongst people or between peoples when people when their water supply ends and they move into another area. Do you, would you not think? Well, that's no. You're exactly on point. You know, this is not a isolated matter. The, you know, when sea level rise in Palau, it will affect 15,000 people, but when it rises in Bangladesh in the Delta, it'll set 40 million people in motion. Uh, and where are they going to go? And where are they going to live? And what are they going to eat? So really, those are the kinds of security issues that the world is going to have to start wrestling with uh, because it's happening and it's going to happen in an accelerated way. Uh, and in Africa, clearly the many of the big fights there are resource wars and involve water. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Mm -hmm. It's often said that, that water will be the oil or the petroleum of the 21st century, and we're moving in that direction very quickly. Oh, well, yeah, I think you're right. It yeah. certainly is. It, mm -hmm. We were talking about oceans, and there were two, uh, I mentioned in the introduction about bottom trawling and finning, and those are two very important issues that we seldom hear about or read about. Let's talk about the finning, mm. uh, shark finning. Uh, what mm. exactly are we talking about with mm. uh, sharks that are being decimated through this finning process? There's a, you know, there's a big trade in shark fin soup that people somehow think this adds potency. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has it's nutritional value. Mm -hmm. But the way shark fin soup is made is that sharks are caught. Their fins are generally cut off while they're alive, and their carcasses are thrown back in the water. So they're holding up the fin. Now, Palau was the world's first shark sanctuary. 
declared that nobody's going to kill sharks in its waters. And an Australian economist came to Palau and found, uh, calculated that a live shark in Palau was worth $2 million in its lifetime in increased tourist revenues, where a dead shark was worth $300 for its fin. Mm -hmm. So again, the world has to rethink the way it feels about these issues because whole countries, economies, depend upon a healthy ocean, which includes sharks. You know, when, when you take that apex predator out of the chain, it destroys the reefs. So it becomes the end of the tourism economies of the Caribbean, the Pacific, and all others. Why should they give that up to shark finners? You know, mm -hmm. wh why would you trade all that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, the world is starting to notice, with bottom trawling too, why would you trade all that for some private interest that wants to make a couple of bucks, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, this either is a common heritage of mankind or it isn't. So it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So why do we let people do that? Exactly. Oh. And we're talking about sharks, and this uh, seems like such a terrible loss of a beautiful animal to start off with. Yeah. But also they do, they provide a very valuable service by taking care of certain <laughs> elements or certain entities in the ocean that would, would become predators on their own if the sharks weren't there. But also, I've, I've seen statistics now, I know it's hard to determine how many sharks are being killed, but I've seen statistics ranging from like 80 to 100 million sharks a year are being killed for their fins. That, I, I don't know how many sharks are living in the ocean, but that seems like a huge number, and it's unsustainable. That's, that's Pew, you know, the Pew people do great work on this, on the shark issue, and I think that their research indicates that it's, it's like 75 million sharks a year, and that it's clearly not sustainable, and that the world has to rise up and do something about it. And it is, people are increasingly becoming conscious of it, you know, thanks to public information People start to see these things and start to address them. And that's the great value of this wonderful United Nations is that a little country like Palau could come forward and raise an issue on this stage. And the stage becomes a way for the world to hear about it. Palau announced its shark sanctuary from the podium at the General Assembly. And it radiated around the world. And now there are 20 countries that are part of a coalition saving sharks. So it's, it's really a great story for the United Nations, for public information, and for the uh, need for transparency in everything we do. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Palau. I think you have 20,000 people, a population of 20,000, but it's quality. It's not <laughs> quantity. That's very important. So My wife would appreciate that everybody, remark. <laughs> she's Palau. Yes. <laughs> yes. She would appreciate but that. everybody has a role to play. <laughs> and that's, that is one of the advantages of the United Nations General Assembly. You have 193 countries. They all have equal votes. One, one country, one state, one vote. And that's the way it works. And so you, you do have an opportunity to have input into the discussion, into setting the agenda, into developing solutions at the United Nations. And Palau, I think, has certainly shown the way on this and has been a leader in many respects. Now there's another issue that you are very passionate about and that is bottom fishing or trawling, I guess is what I should say. Yeah. What exactly is that and why is that detrimental? <coughs> there's a great, another great group of NGOs called the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Uh, Pew, Greenpeace, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. They've been fighting on bottom trawling issue for a long time because what bottom trawling is is literally rolling large rollers across the bottom of the sea and taking whatever species are down at the bottom. And this occurs on some of the most biodiverse parts of the oceans, the seamounts. You know, the ocean is not flat with nothing on it. It's got a, thousands of, sea, of, ocean, of, of mountains just mm -hmm. below the surface. And it's on the side of those mountains that life aggregates with the upcurrents. And it's, that's where the trawlers uh, go the bottom trawlers. So they just scoop up everything from the bottom right up to the side of that mountain. And the problem with it is it kills all the coral forever. Mm -hmm. So that you can actually track from the sea the trails of bottom trawlers who have killed reefs as they go. You've seen those pictures, haven't you? Oh, yes. And again, it was a matter of transparency that once this issue was exposed, again, right here at the UN, People started to pay attention to it because you couldn't hide anymore from how odious it is to destroy the common heritage of mankind this way. So it's a continuing fight, but we've made a lot of progress. And the European Parliament 
is debating right now, as we speak, bo banning bottom trawling for all European countries, that they won't be able to do it. And that's important because they're the ones that do it. Exactly. Will the Convention on the Laws, the Sea Treaty, we won't get into that, we don't have time, but will that have an effect on this? You know, the Law of the Sea Treaty actually prescribes all these things. They're just not enforced. You know, it's a wonderful treaty. It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the savior of the islands in many ways, but we're allowing the oceans to be plundered despite the fact that that treaty is in effect. So it's important, but ignored. And that's the key. You have the conventions, you have the rules, you have the regulations in place, but it, they have to be enforced. And it's really up to the countries of the world to do this and to inf reinforce one another and enforce one another, I guess, to a large degree. But these, these are extremely important issues, they're very important topics. And I know when I think back, not well, it's been a few years ago now, the former president of the Maldives, uh, the archipelago over in the Indian Ocean, uh, Mohammed Rashid, Nasheed, had a uh, he had a, a really dramatic uh, display of holding a meeting underwater with yeah, scuba yeah, gear. Yeah. So I would encourage our viewers to take a look at that and go to yeah, YouTube and find it's it. Wonderful, yeah. Ambassador Stuart Beck, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. My pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.